Hello. Uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask one question because I wasn't able to hear any English sentence in this room. So is there anyone who doesn't speak Polish? Okay, nice one. We can continue in English. Yeah, it's better to ask, especially when you are at a conference in Poland. So <laughs> I hope you understand. Yeah, so my name is Łukasz Pyrzyk and today I would like to tell you something about structures in .NET. I know that in the presentation title on the conference it was only about structures, but I don't know why somebody just truncated the last word. <laughs> so this presentation will be focused on .NET, however I will give you some examples in Java and C++, so I hope it won't be so difficult for you if you are not a .NET developer. Uh, let me share a few words about me. Uh, I work for Ryanair as a senior software developer, I'm a fan of uh, low-level and performance programming. I'm trying to do as things as fast as possible. Uh, from time to time, I'm occasionally open source contributor. However, I'm always trying to compare those two gifts into my daily work. <laughs> so uh, that's me. And the structures. Um, as you know, several languages have structures and classes and different types of data to hold. For example, in C++, there are structures and classes, but to be honest, at least for me, there is no big difference between them. Uh, as far as I know, the remember, the difference between structures and classes in C++ is mostly about the accessibility and the default behavior during the inheritance. So it's nothing different and nothing, el nothing else to learn. However, in Java, Java is a little bit more complicated because JVM has primitives represent as value types, and for example, this is int and another primitives. However, you as a developer, you are not allowed to create your own value type. Uh, when it comes to .NET, .NET supports more value types than you expect because a value type is also an enum. And I guess one point for interview question, when it comes to reference type, which are also popular in .NET, we have also delegates and interfaces. So delegates and interface is also a reference type. And they are one more special type, which is not value type, to be honest, and not a reference type, and you may trick pointer as it is. Um, let's go further. So why you should care about structures, especially in .NET, which for the long time was represent a slow language comparing to the C++ and Sensra. Why you should care about structures and some optimization when you have garbage collector? So I decided to prepare a small benchmark. Let's imagine that you have the same representation of data, but in structure and in class. We have one field called X and one field called X in the structures and class. So what could be the benchmark? I've decided to create one million of structures and objects and put them into the array. I'm using benchmark.net, it is a library to benchmarking code in .NET. Basically, in the global setup method uh, will prepare a data for me. Um, the method called struct will be run as a first one several times, and benchmark.net will try to run this method as long as it needed to calculate the correct performance of it. And the, let's say, opponent is a method called class, which does exactly the same. I'm walking through all objects inside this array of one million elements and I'm adding the value and I'm returning this value to the user. So basically the benchmark is about processing huge amount of objects or structures and comparing which behavior was faster. So maybe you know what will be the answer. Who will win? Yes, structures. On my computer with i3 for at least five years, it was the difference was about around 40 percentage. However, on your computer, the result might be different because you have another CPU, another cache, and another memory RAM. I will explain it later. However, at least on my computer, the difference was about 40 percent. But why? Why you should care about such microseconds? Well, does it really matter for you? Do you know the game on the screen? It's screen from ROM Total War 2, as far as I know. And on the screenshot, you may see the big army of some Roman people. And somewhere uh, further, there is a second army, the opponent's army. And I guess it has the pretty much the same size. And why I'm talking about this? Imagine that you have 
free to game written in Unity. Unity allows you to create games using C Sharp. The game contains one million of elements visible to the user. It might be a player, it might be some pl uh, something on the ground, so like tree. And game needs to be a real time. Game are represented to be as real time applications, except the strategies, some of them. So the real time means that the data on the screen needs to be refreshed several times per second. And usually it is called frame per second. So if when we are writing game in Unity, we need to process all elements visible on the map. So let's imagine a game similar to the ROM Total War with an in C sharp and just just by playing with simple structs instead of classes, we are able to speed up the game for a, more a very, very long value. Yeah, but is it just, just it? Structures are faster and that's it? I decided to go deeper. And let's create a small comparison between them. All, all objects, I mean instances of classes, contain one, sorry, two, um, Oh, sorry, not the same. Um, objects are always allocated on the heap, which means that garbage collector needs to create an object for you and put this object into its memory. It needs to remember that this object needs to be del deleted after some time when it's needed. However, allocation on the heap is pretty much fast because .NET doesn't allocate new memory after new allocation all the time. It tries to pre-allocate some, some period of RAM for you. That's why pretty much all .NET applications uses around one 10 megabytes, even if it is just small console write line. Garbage collector reserved more RAM for you just to make the application faster. When it comes to structs, well, structs are allocated on the stack and on the heap. And this is also one of the most popular questions for the .NET developer on the interview, where the structs go. Basically, the simplest answer is that they go so there where they were created. So if you are creating struct on the struct during the method call, which is on the stack, it will be on the stack. However, if the structure is created as a field for the object and object needs to be on the heap, structure will be always also on the heap. So structs are more complicated and this answer is not so simple. However, the structs are even cooler because the allocation values from the stack and structures on them are, is pretty fast. It's called the stack unwind. For example, if you have a method which allocates a lot of structures, like local variables, and this method ends, this whole stack is unwind in the one O of one period of time. So it is pretty much very, very fast. However, you need to remember about stack overflow, that each thread which you runs on your application has some memory to use on the stack. So you need to remember that it's easy to allocate things from the stack. However, the stack is limited, where the heap might be not. Yeah, but is it deep enough for you? I think not. <laughs> so, objects. Um, every instance of object in .NET has two additional fields required by CLR. They are created just to make C Sharp and .NET work. First of them is object header. It is, it is a mix of flags and values used by runtime to make this to make this strict as an object. For example, in this place, we have an information if the object is locked and if yes, by which ID, thread ID. So in this object header, we are just saving information about the object. Is it locked, etc. cetera. Um, it is used on on the int size, so it contains only four bytes. However, if you are working on the x64 environment, sometimes .NET will add additional four bytes, which are not really needed, but they are just padding the structure to be more optimal for the processor. There's also uh, one more thing, more interesting, and this is the pointer to the method table. This is a pointer which decides, which helps you helps runtime to decide which method should be called during the execution. Basically, this allows you to write inheritance, to write virtual abstract method over write them and centra. And the whole decision which method should be called is done using this pointer to the method table. I think the code is easier to understand for another developer, so I found uh, a representation of object in .NET written in the C++ header. So we have define. 
I think if you have written C and C++, you know that this is defined stuff. And there is an important information that the minimum object size is 2 multiplied by size of pointer to the byte plus size of object header. Why? Basically, runtime reserves some space. Um, size pointer of byte is required to have a pointer to the method table, so we have one pointer. Later on, we have size of object header, so we reserve the place for the object header. But why we are multiplying the first value by two? Well, somebody in Microsoft decided that it is really there is no sense in creating empty, empty object, and all object will contain some data. So they decided to pre-allocate a data for your values. So even if your structure, sorry, if your, if your class is empty, it will have a place for one or two values. And the most interesting information from this slide, at least for me, is that even empty object in .NET waves 20 bytes in x32 architecture and 24 on the x64. So it's multiplied by two. CPU. Do you know what you can do you with your CPU in the phone or in the laptop? Uh, I heard that from a lot of the C# -sharp developers that they are writing business applications and that's it. However, I found a gif that you can do C# -sharp, you can do this with your CPU. As <laughs> well, that will happen if you overclock your processor <laughs> and put some meal on it. Yeah, but why CPU matters for developers, especially C# -sharp developers? Well, if you know the internals of it, you are a better developer and you may use more things. Because CPU has a cache, and this is called um, L something cache. I, there is a cache for definitions LD and cache for uh, instructions LE and cache for definitions LD. And this cache helps CPU to preload more data and make the execution faster. Why? Because each call to the memory RAM is slow. Even if you have ever heard that memory is cheap and you should always load everything to the memory from the hard disk, yes, that's true. But call from processor to the memory is also quite, at least not for cheap, not cheap. And you can understand that we have a CPU. The closest cache is cache L1, and this cache ha is, is quite small, but it's assigned to the core. Upper on it, we have cache L2, which is used by another course. It, uh, it shares some values, but it's a little bit bigger. But access to it is slower. On it, we have L3, which is even bigger, but access to it is even, even slower. Later on, we have some memory and to disk. Um, processor never asks for only one byte, on, uh, only one bit, even four of them. Processor operates on something called cache lines or cache block. Um, Usually this block contains 64 bytes. So let's imagine that you are a processor. You need some data to run a program. You never ask, give me one byte. You are asking, I'm giving you a cache line. Please fulfill it for me. I will decide if this data was required for me or not, but maybe it will be. Basically, the cost of reading one byte and 64 byte is pretty much the same. That's why process processor usually reads more data than it's needed, but it might be help in the future. When? It is related to my previous benchmark. This is just a reminder. We have class X and structure X. Now imagine that we have a cache line. This cache line has 64 bytes. I've decided to, tr to put, put it into 16 uh, blocks. Each block contains uh, four bytes. So let's load one object into this cache line. Done. Why so many? Uh, so many rows, uh, columns were colored. The first one is for object header. It is four bytes, so the first one is for object header. However, C# -sharp decide I don't. I would like to add some padding for it because I don't like values not divided by eight. So it just adds one more block, which is to be honest empty, and it's completely not used. F next four of them are reserved for the pointer to the method table, and next the last colored blocks are for your data. Even if I add only one X, which requires four bytes, 
I have place for two, and size of this object will be the same, even if the class will be empty, even if it has one int or two ints, it will wave the same. So I will read one more, and that's it. I cannot read one more because I'm out of cache line. So I read 2.67 cache line elements into the cache line during only one read. However, when it comes to structures, I can read one structure, second structure, until the end. And by that, I can read 16 items during one read to, to the memory. And basically, that is the reason why structures won in my benchmark. Have you ever been asked if the size matters? I hope not. <laughs> However, I think in programming size matters re really, really. Why? The cost of passing an existing structure depends on its size. Because you may hear that structures in .NET are passed by copy. So if you are passing a structure to the method, all data needs to be copied to, copied to the next structures, and this new structure will be given to the method. So if your structure contains 10 bytes, 10 bytes needs to be copied. However, if your structure holds several bytes or even 100 bytes, all of this needs to be co uh, copied. However, now the class wins, because the cost of passing object to the method is always constant, and because we need to just pass a reference, which basically is uh, some secured pointer. So when we are need to pass a big piece of data, big meta model. I will suggest you to pass by class or by reference, which I will show you later. The general rule is to keep in mind that the structure should be small, small as possible, but still usable. There is no sense of creating several structures holding only one integer, or maybe that is your business problem, but I never spotted this one. Um, in another case, JIT will be required to generate more move in structures on the assembly level, and basically the whole execution will be slower, if even if your attempt I was to make the program faster. Um, I read on the Stack Overflow that the best size for the structure is around 16 bytes. However, down and down, there is information that Microsoft changed it to 24 bytes. And as far as I know, that's the latest value for it. However, I wasn't able to find any good source to commit this sentence. So please keep in mind that the size matters, where at least I don't know the correct number for the structures. It should be uh, around 16 bytes, maybe something bigger, but I don't know, and I don't sh know if Microsoft published it manually. Passing structure. As I told you, you can pass them manually. Let's imagine that we have structure called point 3D, and this structure contains three double doubles properties. Double has eight bytes, so um, the whole cost of passing one point 3D is around four tw and 24 bytes, and only one. We need to pass two of them. And after a while, this structure may grow to point 4D, 5D, I don't know what will be the IMAX new feature in the next year. So is there a better way to do it, maybe more performant? It is. You can pass structure by reference. It allows you to pass structure, pass address of the structure in memory, and the cost of it will be al always constant. It behaves pretty much the same as passing normal object. However, there is one negative of this. Do you know any? What, what may happen if you pass structure as a reference? There is a big danger, because structure is known as passed by copy. So even if you modify point.x in the previous slide, nothing happens in the color. However, if you change point.x on y in this method, the owner of this structure will be o won't be notified that you changed something, but the value will be different. So basically, if you are working with I don't want to say poor coders, but people that usually want to change a code somewhere in strange places, they may do it in here. So you may gain a performance, however, the code is more dangerous and debugging of this code might be even more difficult for you. So that's why after several years, Microsoft announced one change. 
there is a new keyword in C Sharp 7.2. This keyword is called in. <laughs> and basically, it allows you to pass a structure as a reference, but it will be restrict to modify any property on it. So if you are ever programmed in C or C++, it's just const pointer. So <laughs> it's a concept known for years, but Microsoft decided to introduce it in 2017. Yeah, but still it is possible to gain uh, even more performance with structures and keep the code safe. You can use this modifier not only to the methods, but you can call them on delegates, lambdas, local functions, etc. And if you want to turn, off turn on this feature, basically please upgrade your MS build on the servers for the first step. <laughs> Later on, you need to update Visual Studio and, as far as I know, change one line in the CS Pro to support the newest version of C Sharp. And that's it, you can use the newest feature. Um, next point is about inheritance, also known problem when it comes to interviews. So, can you inherit from structure? No. Yes, good answer, you cannot. But why do we have method like get hash code or to string or equals and why we are overriding them where are they from yeah the answer is not so easy uh, structures are derived from class system.value type and system.value type is from system.object so basically structs inherits from object however it's done during the runtime and you are not allowed to do it by your own so structure can inherit from something, but you are not to do it your own by your own. Have you ever heard about boxing and unboxing? On one of the conferences I'd heard that boxing is, for example, not good if you have the latest iPhone, <laughs> because you may not be able to unblock it. Yeah, but it's good to remember, boxing is bad, especially when you have the iPhone. Why it's bad? I will try to explain you. Boxing is a process of copying the value type inside the reference type. And in the runtime, .NET, and the run .NET just creates a new object, wraps the your value into a new object, but please keep in mind that it object needs to be created and allocated by garbage collector. So after a while, garbage collector will be responsible for releasing this object. So after each boxing, you're adding more overhead to the garbage collector, even if your intent was to speed up the performance by using structures. How to box something? Let's imagine that you have some value type. Later on, you are creating an object and you're assigning this value type to the object. You can do it with explicit casting or just implicit one. It's quite easy. And unboxing is the reverse process. However, unboxing, it is required to use ex explicit casting so in this time you're creating new value type and you are need to ex explicitly say that I want to get an int from this object because you may cast, for example, to I uh, int on assigned int. But boxing. Have you ever done boxing manually in your career? By purpose, let's say. I do it only one time, but without purpose, very often. Why? Imagine that you have method equals on the structure. I guess somebody just like to compare the structures. So as you can see, this method expects object. So every time when you call method equals on the structure, it will be automatically boxed onto the object. Object will be remembered by garbage collector. You need to cast it again inside to your structure, compare the values and exit from the method and the garbage collector will have to remove this object which you created somewhere later. So pretty much we are losing everything what we wanted by just calling method equals. Sometimes you call this method even if you don't know about it. For example, let's imagine that you have a dictionary. You would like to create a dictionary where key is a structure. When, when you are adding new value to the dictionary, it runs get hash code and equals method. So always when you create a dictionary or create a, for example, even simple list, and you have, when you called list.contains, which walks through the whole list and compares the structure, 
it will be allocate a lot of things inside. So is there a better way to do it? Exactly. There is an interface called iEcutable. <laughs> I learned to <laughs> say this word a few times. <laughs> it allows you, well, it forces you to write a method equals with the generic type, and it recommends you to overwrite the get hash code method. I will explain li later why get hash code is also needed. However, whenever .NET needs equals method, it always checks if, th if there is a possibility to run equals from the IEQ table. And calling this method from the interface is not going to create any special object. So it's really, really important. Basically, there is a rule that if you ever create your own structure, it's better to run this method just to don't forget about it. Because you may call those methods like equals many times without knowing about it. Next thing is interface or interfaces. As you know, value types can implement interfaces. If you have FreeSharper and you decompile even the int, it, you, you will see that int implements several interfaces inside. However, interfaces are quite, let's say, challenging because on the second slide I told you that interface is a reference type. So value type implements the reference type and it's dangerous when it comes to performance. On the slide, I have iPrintable interface with print method, and my structure implements it by just calling console write line. So what may happen? Let's create a static method main, create our new structure, and call simple method print. The print accepts iPrintable item to print, and it will just call the implementation. This method to call needs to be decided on the runtime. So what may happen? Yeah, good learners, or you knew it. <laughs> That's good. This is a code from the EL. Um, it's an intermediate language that C Sharp compiles into Visual Basic and Visual C++ as far as I know, and F Sharp. And this code will be interpreted to the machine code later. And on the line 21, you can see the keyword called box. So we are doing some boxing. Later on, the um, iPrintTable method expects class testproject.iPrintTable, and the definition is quite similar. It's void print class namespace iPrintTable print item print. So, is that means that each call through the interface is costly for the structures? Maybe there is a better way to write this method. Exactly. There is a one trick in .NET that except creating a method which accepts interface, you may create a generic method that accepts T, and this T needs to be required to be a structure that implements iPrintTable. And under the hood, it will behave the same. However, we will avoid boxing. In that case, we don't have this box keyword inside, and the definition of method is quite different. Right now, it expects a value type. Uh, it's called value type, which has a constructor, iPrintTable. If you would like to be aware of any potential and dangerous allocations in your application, I strongly recommend you to install Heap Allocation Viewer. It's an uh, add-in for the ReSharper. I hope you have ReSharper. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to find something s at least similar with similar capabilities just for Visual Studio, but it was uh, difficult. So I think you should install this one. It's cheap and it will just prompt you that you have boxed something or, or you just allocated new object. How it looks like? For example, you may have a boxing when you create a method which expects params. Params allows you to pass a one element, two elements, or array of elements. Under the hood, .NET will create your new array for you and put items which you passed inside of it. So I passed two strings, hello and word. So .NET in the runtime time will create a special array with two elements for it. It will put my objects to this array and will put the whole new array in inside the methods. As you can see, the allocation viewer prompts me that there is a hidden object allocation, parameters, allocation, arcs, creation. <laughs> yeah, quite not easy to spell it. But it allows you basically to discover all allocations and there are the things which are happening in your code. You may ex there is a one negative sentence about this add-in. For example, 
if you make a mistake in your code and you will try to compile it, the sum of the lines will be underlined with red line. Unfortunately, this tool also uses red underlines <laughs> for some different behavior. So you may think that something is broken, is red, but to be honest, it's not. And you just need to change the colors. And now I would like to go to the one of the trickiest thing in my presentation. And it is hash code. Hash code is really, really interesting part, especially when it comes to structures. Because let's imagine that we have our old friend structure with one x, one uh, integer. I will create a method which creates first structure where the x is 4, second structure where the x is also 4. And now I would like to write to the console if the hash code of the first structure is equal to the hash code from the second structure. So we have two different structures, but it they hold the same data. So what is your expectations? What will be in the console? True, false? True? Who is true? Who's saying true? OK, false? More people. And the answer is, it's true. So when we have int properties and they are the same, they host the same data, answer is true. Let's play more. I added a y integer, and, and this time, the second structure has y2, where the first one has y1. So we have different data. So let's imagine the, the x is the same, but the y is different. And I'm running the same code. Get hash code equals to get hash code. False, true. Ho who is for false? True. Nobody? OK, one person. So the answer is. It's false. So we have different data, and the uh, hash code is different. So let's play more. Now I have my old friend x and my new friend y, which is now short. Short is a numeric type which holds two bytes, where int holds four bytes. The implementation of the main method is pretty much the same. x is 1 and where the y is 1 times 1, the second one is 2. And I'm running the get hash code on them. So let's wait for some photos. <laughs> <laughs> I will share the presentation later, so we will be able to do it on your home. So what will be your expectations? True or false? So who is for false? Who is for true? OK, free person. And it's true. Hash code of the structures, which are different, is the same. But in previous example, it was true. Why? I'll explain you in next slide. And that was my reaction when I learned about it. Unfortunately, I learned around it when I was searching for the bug. <laughs> so I spent at least four hours why, my, why I have new things in my dictionary. Yeah, and the last example. X is the same, however, I change the Y again. Now the Y is hello, and in the second, it's world. Any predictions? Who is for true? True, one. OK, for false? Most of the people. And the answer is true. They are also equals. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can imagine, I have different strings in my structure, and I have the same hash code. Tricky, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why? And the answer is not easy, because if the structure has a gap, or any reference type, um, the hash code will be calculated only from the first value type spotted by reflection. What means gap? Let's imagine that I have structure with two ints. They hold four bytes, so in the sum they hold eight bytes. Processor likes and jitter likes everything which is divided by eight, so it's OK. However, when my second example y was short, the whole structure has six bytes, .NET decides to add two more bytes of padding just to make the whole execution faster and more predictable for the processor. 
In the last example, I used a uh, string, which is the reference type. Why is it dangerous to run hash code on the uh, reference type? Because basically, you never know where the pointer to the reference type is. If you allocate a string, you may know the answer, where is it? However, after garbage collector runs and some comparison and compaction, the address may change. It may be just fragmented and defragmented. So if there is any gap or reference type, hash code is calculated from the first element in the structure, which is a value type. And that goes to one tricky problem. Let's say that you have old application without unit test. And this application uses three, it uses structures. By changing order of the fields or properties, you may break the code. <laughs> so it's quite dangerous to change anything in structures if you are not aware of it and if you don't have unit tests. In other case, CLR just goes through all bits and it, and it XORs them. It looks like it's a correct hash because all values are used. However, I wouldn't rely on it because maybe somewhere in the future somebody will change your code because maybe you put an integer for an, an age and somebody will say integer is too big number for an age. It should be just, let's say, byte or short. We are losing memory. And after this small change, which was supposed to be improvement, we have broken implementation. In summary, structs are complicated. However, objects are even more. They have two additional fields which are required by Celeron to run the .NET code. The smallest .NET object has 12 bytes on x32 and 24 on x65. Structs don't have, don't have those fields and objects, so usually they are faster when it comes to processing them in batches. Allocation and the allocation of the local value types is extremely fast, and that's why you should prefer it. Um, the size matters, so even if you are playing with structures because you want to optimize something, please keep in mind that the size of the structure is important for you. It's very easy to accidentally box your structure and lose everything what you are working for. For example, if you ever use a linku, you need to pass a lambda expression, and if you catch something in this lambda expression, you are also boxing. And get hash code implementation is tricky, and for me, you should never rely on it. If you want to have a correct hash code from the structure, you should use some algorithm known by mm, known by another people I created in some libraries. I saw that there is w there was a merge pull request to the .NET Core, and since the next release 2.1, we will have an XX hash built in .NET. So it will be just easy just to call system.hashcode, you will pass the structure and it will, be it will try to calculate the correct hash without relying on the addresses of memory on store gaps. Um, if you are interested in this topic, there are a few really nice blogs. First of them is Geeks with Blogs, when there is a whole category about performance in .NET. There is also a great post done by John Skid, which explains how memory and string works in .NET. I learned a lot from the net inverse uh, blogs where there's a series of blog posts about internals in .NET like uh, design of the structures and objects and the reason why they are created like that. And I need to say that it is a really good blog of Adam Sitnik, who is our Polish guy from Gdańsk. And he wrote a really nice article about comparison between value types and reference type. So I really recommend you to read this. And that's it from me. I think I have 10 minutes, so maybe it is a good time for questions. Yeah, one? Yeah, it, it might be true. However, maybe C is more performant. I definitely say that it is. However, if you would like to port your C code to different platform, it would be really more difficult for you. And I know that there are some experts in writing the performance C-sharp and .NET code. 
even like in Java, and they create pr they can create pretty much the same performance as you can do in C or any language with garbage collector. For example, as far as I know, Kafka is written in Java and it is supposed to be the most performant system for processing messages. So I don't think that you shouldn't rely on any language with garbage collector. For me, it's good to know how to write a fast code, but usually you don't, you don't need it. It's just your own knowledge. Okay, we don't have any other questions. I will stay here for one, one next hour. If you want the slides from presentation, I think I will tweet a link to my presentation that you are really, you can enjoy it and t t check them on home. Thank you very much. <laughs>